An awful lot of biblical material in that uh, two minutes that you just saw. In fact, almost the entire First and Second Samuel pretty well uh, covered in that uh, little bit of video. So again, as I have uh, sought the Lord in terms of where to go with uh, this whole uh, story of David, uh, again, I have really felt led that I'm to go to the beginning of the story. Why did God select David? What was the rationale? Was there any rationale as to why God would select this youngest son of of Jesse's, probably still a teenager, uh, definitely a shepherd, uh, and and no real status of any kind within the community that he that he was raised in. Why would God pick David? Well, the answer is in First Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 to 13. It's page 277 in your pew Bible, and again. Um, Saul's death is in chapter 31 of Samuel, so they've covered an awful lot of material in uh, this particular section. But again, Jim, thank you for getting this up on the board for us. You're welcome to follow it uh, on the video or in your Bible. First Samuel, thir- the first 13 verses of sap- chapter 16. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, How can I go? Saul will hear about it and kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of town trembled when they met him. They asked, Do you come in peace? Samuel replied, Yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, Nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered, but he is tending the sheep. Samuel said, Send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent and had him brought in. He was ruddy with a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. He is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Samuel then went to Ramah. Lord, would you help us today to determine in our own hearts that we will look at this world and each other with a totally different perspective than this world does? that you would help us to understand that it's the heart that matters. And we thank you in your name. Amen. TheStory.com, which we have been working through since September, takes us this morning to the person who, even after 3,000 years, is in many ways the symbol of Israel. And yet, when one looks at David's story from beginning to the end, it's really the story of a very simple and, yes, a very flawed man. Today, we're going to start at the beginning, when Samuel anoints David to follow Saul I, the first king of Israel. Next Sunday, we will investigate the David and Bathsheba story, 
which reveals David at his worst. I've titled that message for next Sunday, The Freedom of Forgiveness. A very simple and a very flawed person. We'll see that next week for sure. On this first Sunday of Advent, as we prepare to come around the Lord's table in just a few moments, I have felt led to center on the very beginning of the historical account of the life of David as recorded in First and Second Samuel. This is an intriguing passage of Scripture because of the person Samuel and his continuing role in the history of Israel. He's the anointer of Saul. He's the one to whom God gives the message that he has rejected Saul as king, and now he'll be the one who will uh, anoint David. Follow with me through the text of Scripture as I highlight several of the things that are important in these 13 verses of Scripture. Uh, interestingly enough, it starts off by God saying to Samuel, Samuel, it's time to move on from Saul. I've rejected him because of his disobedience. And you know, there are times in our lives when God says to us, it's time to move on. And here's one of those moments in Scripture where Samuel is to disconnect from Saul. Saul's tenure is over. His, his kingship has, is, is over. And now it's time for Samuel to move on. He says, God says to Samuel, I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. Now, interestingly enough, we've looked at this through the story as well. Uh, Jesse is the grandson of Ruth. We looked at Ruth two, three weeks ago. The Moabitess Ruth, not a Jewish person, becomes the grandmother of Jesse and the great-grandmother of David. I have chosen one of Jesse's sons to be king. Samuel says, no way am I going to anoint another king while the original king, Saul I, is still alive. He's going to kill me. God assures him in verse 3, no, he won't kill you. It's going to be a worship event. Invite Jesse to the service, and I'll show you which one of his sons will become king. So Samuel arrives in Bethlehem. The elders are alarmed as soon as they see him. Again, because there's this uncertainty of what's going on in the country because of Saul's uh, flawed leadership. And so uh, the elders say to Samuel, do you come in peace? And Samuel says, yes, I come in peace. I'm, I'm going to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves. Get yourselves ready for this big event. So... Samuel tells Jesse to begin this parade of his sons. We see that in verse 5 and following, verse 6. Samuel thinks it's this first son, this firstborn. He must have been tall and very handsome, Eliab. And he says, God, I'm ready to anoint Eliab. The Holy Spirit says to Samuel, no, don't. And then we have this really important verse of scripture in fact if you're looking for a principle in holy scripture if you're looking for principles of holy scripture that that tie scripture together this is on the this is in the top 10 do not consider his appearance or his height for i have rejected him the lord does not look at things man looks at man looks at the outward appearance but the Lord looks at the heart. The heart of the matter, he says, is the matter of the heart. The heart of the matter in God's world, in God's kingdom, in the way God conducts himself in this world, is the matter of the heart. So, again, the parade of sons continues. Abinadab, no. Shama, no. There's seven in total. We're not told all the names of Jesse's sons that are paraded before Samuel. Finally, Samuel says to Jesse, any more sons? Are these all your sons? And Jesse says, no, but you wouldn't be possibly interested in the one that isn't here. You wouldn't have any interest in him whatsoever. He, he's just a shepherd. He's a kid. He's a teenager. And he's out there with those dirty old sheep. Now, interestingly enough, 
shepherds and sheep are a pretty important image in Scripture too. In fact, as we think about the Christmas story, to whom do the angels announce first that Messiah has been born? It's those dirty shepherds that are looking after sheep. So Samuel says, go for that youngest son. He arrives, verse 12. He's, the scripture says he was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Well, doesn't that sound like the outward thing that he, just he rejected with Eliab? Oh, yeah, it does. But there's one more piece, and that is that God has that inward perspective. He knows David's heart. He sees the outside, but it's the inside that matters. Samuel didn't have inward access. God did. And God says to Samuel, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the presence of his brothers. Now that must have been quite an interesting thing. All these older brothers watching as the youngest is anointed. And the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then returned to his home in Ramah. I want you to imagine for a moment this morning that you are a human resources manager at an office here in Peterborough. You have advertised for a position that is available and the resumes are in. The resumes reflect a wide variety of ages, experience, and education. Some of those resumes can be dealt with easily. The candidates who do not have the education, the experience, or who are either too young or too old are set aside quickly. That's just the way the world works today. Now I want you to put that human resources hat on and enter this Samuel David story. And I want to look at all the criteria that would cause us to reject the resume and all the criteria that cause God to accept the resume. First, the youngest. David, his age. David, the youngest of at least eight brothers. He has no life experience. I often hear parents say, boy, I wish these teenagers would grow up. And, and what occurs to me is that well, you can't ask a teenager to act like an adult because they don't have enough life experience yet. Because maturity is the product of time plus experience. And if you don't have the time, even if you do have lots of experience, there's a certain subtleness that comes in life as one ages. And an 18-year-old will not have the maturity of a 25-year-old just by definition. So you've got this 17-year-old, doesn't matter what his life experience, in this case David doesn't have any anyway. So automatically you look at this resume and you throw it in the no pile. There's no question it doesn't, it, it, that David's not qualified, just strictly on age. Now let's go to experience, the second criteria that we've used. Well, he's a shepherd. There's nothing special about shepherds. In fact, in the ancient Near East, they're the lower class. Dirty sheep equals dirty shepherds. David's not ready for a white-collar job. And it's important to note in this story that David is the only one of the brothers tending the sheep. The brothers are with their father, so he may have been a fairly compliant person. And compliance doesn't work real well when you're the king of Israel. So based on his experience, we reject his resume. Based on his age, we reject his resume. Now what about education? <laughs> Absolutely nothing to report. It turns out that David becomes the finest poet in the history of Israel. The Psalms are the writings of David, primarily the writings of David. But Samuel has no way of knowing that when he's 16 or 17 years of age. So you put David's resume on all three counts, age, experience, and education. You put them all in the no pile. 
but not God. God doesn't. And the reason why, and the reason why even after the David and Bathsheba account that we'll look at next Sunday, the reason why David is accepted is because of his heart. Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected Eliab. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So in God's selection process, the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. That's the whole idea of the Christian faith. It's not what we are on the outside. It's not what we do for God. It's what he has done for us and our response to that gift. There are so many important external signals in this story. The location is Bethlehem. Bethlehem figures pretty prominently in the Christmas story. But it boils down to this. God has a tendency to pick the person no one else would select to do what he wants done in this world. Uh, I've noticed in the last uh, few weeks all the high school graduations. Pictures in the paper, the great long list of students and all the awards that have been won. Uh, one of the awards that, I don't know whether it still happens or not, but it, it certainly did in my time. That's almost 40 years ago, so uh, things could have changed since then. But uh, the person most likely to succeed, remember that award? If you look at the David story, you've got to say it this way. God would probably pick the person most likely to succeed whom we would see as the least likely to succeed. God has a tendency to see things upside down and backwards. His definition of success is different than our world's. But the simple reason why God selected David and anointed him to follow Saul was that he would become the man after God's own heart. Because the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. So how's your heart today? What's your passion? What drives you? What gives you joy? The fact is that, that God knows the answers to all those questions. I don't need to know them because he sees the heart. He has the internal perspective. He chooses people to change this world, to change your world, the world in which you live, not on the basis of age whether you're too young or too old, not on the basis of career path and experience, not on the education that we might have, but on the heart. Because the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. Fifty years ago last weekend, the Kingsview Free Methodist Church, which is at Islington and Dixon on the west side of Toronto, had its 50-year-old 50th anniversary. I was invited to be part of that because I interned there twice uh, in the summer of 1979. And then uh, after Karen and I were married in 1980, we spent the first year of our marriage in that, in that congregation. I was student intern pastor in the summer of 1979. Uh, the church was uh, only 16 years old then, and I was 24 years of age. And so it was uh, quite a remarkable experience. And, of course, as you know, the west side of Toronto has changed dramatically uh, in that period of time. Selwyn P. Belcher was a uh, leading layman in that congregation. He owned a Canadian tire store down at uh, Dufferin and Castlefield. Later on, it went to uh, Avenue Road and Lawrence Avenue, for those of you who know Toronto. But at that time, it was in, right down in the downtown section there, uh, of Castlefield uh, and a very uh, different neighborhood already. Toronto was changing and all kinds of things that uh, Selwyn Belcher uh, was uh, dealt with and, and was part of in terms of that changing community. I, I became very, very close to him and, and we had a lifelong friendship. He passed away very, very suddenly in uh, 2000, no, 1996. 
uh, of a heart attack at uh, age 69. But I became very, very close to him and very fond of him, and I learned an incredible, incredible number of things from him. One day he said to me, and I still don't know exactly what prompted this, but one day he said to me in his office, Lloyd, someday you're going to be hiring people. I'm 24 years old. I'm interning as a pastor. But he says to me, someday, Lloyd, you're going to hire people. And uh, I guess my ears probably perked up. And uh, so he, he, tended to be, he tended to pontificate at times, I must say that. So he would sit in that chair behind his desk. And he said, I want you to remember this and never forget it. Never hire a person for who they are now. Hire them for what they have the potential of who they have the potential of becoming. That's exactly what Samuel does when he anoints David. The question I have for you this morning as we come now to the table of our Lord. Here's the question. Are you looking at yourself? I think that's where it has to start because often we don't look at ourselves from God's perspective. Are you looking at yourself and others the way God looks at you? Have you even thought about how God sees you? Have you come to that place in your life where you can say, I'm okay with who I am because I know that God loves me, that he created me, that he made me to be who I am. Because people look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, look at my heart this morning. Look at every one of our hearts and show us who we are. Yes, there are things that have got to go. We all know that. But thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your son. Thank you, son, that you were willing to come. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you confirm the truth of your word. Even now, as we look at this David story. There was nothing special about the birth of Jesus that night. When... An innkeeper was asked to find a place for this young woman. He failed because he looked at Mary and Joseph from the outward perspective. Thank you, Jesus, that your eyes are on the inside. And that as we commit ourselves to you, as we trust you to be our Savior, you do the changing. You rearrange the stuff inside. So, Lord, this morning, if there's someone here who's saying, there's no way God would like me, or God doesn't like me the way I am, Lord, help them to know this morning that not only do you like them, you love them, and that you see the potential of what we can become, not where we are now, but where we're going. We thank you, Jesus, that the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. And we'll thank you in your name. Amen.